afternoon. I'm Stacy Wallach, and uh, we're here for the second class of this six-part course on Vietnam. Not the Vietnam War, although we will get to that, but on Vietnam, uh, the people and its history. Uh, and uh, I do assure you that in future classes, uh, you will see names and places that are more familiar uh, than some of the ones I've shown you already. But I hope you're beginning to sense how deep and complex uh, the Vietnamese people are and were in the 40s and 50s and 60s when our involvement uh, became manifest. So today, we're going to look at some biographical information, picking up with where we left off uh, last week. You remember Nguyen, N-G-U, is apparently pronounced N-W-I. If anybody feels stronger that I'm incorrect, I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> Nguyen I Kwok. Remember at the end of the last class, we, we looked at this man with the uh, incredibly intense eyes, uh, who in 1930, out of, apparently out of nowhere, formed the Communist Party not of Vietnam, but the Communist Party of Indochina, which is what the French called Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, and uh, his goal, since he was Vietnamese, uh, was to uh, create a free, independent uh, Vietnam. And there are those eyes. Uh, you really cannot forget those eyes. Everybody who ever met Kwok uh, and wrote about it talked about his eyes. So we're going to. Oh, I'll bet you at least half, maybe all of you knew that his real name wasn't Nguyen I Kwok. All right, you've cut me with my pants down, sort of. Uh, so let's, let's admit and fess up to what his birth name was and who was he. He was Nguyen Sin Kung. That was his birth name, right? You all had that. Right. You all had that. I knew you did. Yes, absolutely. You had that. And he was born in Nue An province. I'll show you where that is in a second. Uh, and the second son of a very minor Mandarin official, uh, dismissed in disgrace, uh, which was just a career ender. Just a, I mean, uh, it's the end of a life if you got dismissed uh, as a Mandarin. Uh, Kung's mother died when he was a kid, and his father uh, really had a nervous breakdown and spent the rest of his life wandering across um, uh, Vietnam as an itinerant teacher, a peddler, a beggar. Uh, Kung was lucky, though. He had uh, reasonably well-off uh, relatives in his province who raised him. Uh, and he managed to attend, not graduate from, but attend the uh, French prep school in Hue, uh, which you know, gives you a classic French education of the time. Uh, he was expelled for uh, not being sufficiently respectful. Uh, I'm showing you this just so you see. Here's the northern portion called Tonkin with its capital city at Hanoi. Here is the long middle section, the French called Hanam, with Hue right here. And here's the southern section called Cochin, China, according to the French, with Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City right here. And uh, so Kung was born up in here. And here he is. Uh, this must have been his uh, lycée, uh, his high school picture. <laughs> and he's soon to leave home, and not just home, but to leave Vietnam for the next 30 years. He traveled the world for the first 20 of those years, uh, and uh, initially working as a kitchen helper. He did this on purpose. He wasn't kicked out of Vietnam. He chose to leave. Uh, it's not entirely clear if there was a single triggering mechanism or not. Uh, and he worked initially as a kitchen helper on freighters and passenger steamships. But this you really have to absorb. Uh, 
I've only mentioned up on the slide, <coughs> Paris, London, New York City. Come visited every major port city in the world, on every continent. Uh, he spent 20 years uh, going from city to city. And when a city interested him, uh, as ultimately New York City did, he jumped ship, let them sail off, and had no trouble, apparently, when he was ready to move on, getting another job. He uh, loved New York City, uh, went all over New York. Um, he felt more comfortable with poor people than rich people. Uh, because he didn't have a lot of money. He uh, was especially impressed by uh, how we took in immigrants, because remember, uh, in the 19-teens and uh, 20s, we were still taking in huge numbers of immigrants. Uh, he spent a good deal of time in minority communities in New York. Uh, he uh, uh, really fell in love with it. Uh, he also liked Paris. Uh, he loved the Folies Berger. He uh, fell in love with Maurice Chevalier and sang Maurice Chevalier's uh, uh, songs for the rest of his life, which you need to tuck away in the back of your head because it will become clearer to you how amazing that is. Never returned to Vietnam. In London, he became the uh, assistant pastry chef for Escoffier, of all people, in the most uh, ritzy hotels in London and Paris, the Savoy and the Ritz, uh, and might have made a career there uh, because Escoffier liked him. Uh, but he really had wanderlust. Uh, uh, one or two historians have compared his worldwide wanderlust to his father's, but I don't see any comparison whatsoever. I think his father was, uh, you know, in the middle of a lifelong nervous breakdown, uh, and uh, Kung was not. Uh, this is where he worked in London. Uh, of course, he didn't work in the dining room. He worked in the uh, kitchens, but it was a pretty ritzy job. Uh, he was uh, working for the man who became the world's most famous chef. Many would say Escoffier invented the profession of chefdom. And here he is, uh, looking like a bar mitzvah boy, but he's actually now 29 years old. Not your idea of a bar mitzvah boy. Well, there's more there than meets the eye. And why is he in Paris in, <coughs> excuse me, in 1919? because that's where the Paris Peace Conference is going on, where the great powers of the world after World War I are busy uh, divvying up the world. And he has a particular reason for wanting to be there. That's when Kung changed his name to Nguyen I Kwok, Nguyen the Patriot. Uh, he was not shy. By the way, by this time, after 20 years at sea, uh, visiting every major port city in the world, you're probably looking at one of the more sophisticated Vietnamese in the world. How many people here have spent 20 years, unbroken, 20 years traveling the major port cities in the world? This is a very, very sophisticated bar mitzvah book. And he started writing essays demanding Vietnamese rights in Paris, of course, which was the uh, capital of France, the colonial ruler of Vietnam. And uh, they started getting circulated. Uh, snail mail. Uh, but they started getting circulated enough so they reached Vietnam. And uh, the French colonial administration read a few of them and without uh, hesitating, condemned him to death. Uh, this was uh, serious business for the French and for Mr. Kwok. And he wanted to meet the big four to plead Vietnam's case uh, for at least equity and autonomy within the French Empire because uh, he was convinced that the French were not only uh, not allowing uh, Vietnamese freedom, but that they were in fact an incredibly repressive regime. There's the big four, Lloyd George of uh, Great Britain, 
Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, Woodrow Wilson of the United States, and remarkably, the big four, if you've read any, there's a book called 1919, which is about this thick. But in fact, it's, it's a really remarkable book because it's how the big four divided up the world into what it looks like today with all the troubles that we've had since World War II with those boundaries that these four guys drew. But the, <coughs> the big four rapidly became the big three. Uh, and uh, who are those two guys in the straw boaters right behind? I would guess they're Secret Service agents. Uh, and Kung, at least this is the story, he was uh, at that moment a dishwasher, uh, got enough money together to rent a cutaway jacket and striped trousers and show up at the uh, uh, hotel where uh, President Wilson has made, had made his headquarters. Knock, knock, knock on the door. I'm here to explain to you uh, why Vietnam should be free. Uh, and he didn't make it past the front door, which was crushing. Uh, so he wrote a letter to him, to Wilson, uh, with a list of demands for freedom for Vietnam. Uh, and um, the reason uh, he was doing all this with Wilson was because Wilson, in 1915, when we were not yet in the war, we were still the last great power neutral, uh, you know, issued these 14 points, which we all studied in school and never read and promptly forgot if we did. But I want to look at just a couple of them. The, the reason I'm looking at the first four is they're the stupidest things I've ever read in my life. <laughs> they are so, they're just so dumb. This is Wilson, a trained lawyer, former president of Princeton University, the president of the United States, who had become quite a politician his first term. Uh, he took all of the uh, uh, goals of the progressive movement and got Congress to pass most of them. And then he puts, in 1915, in the middle of the war, he puts out this nonsense. In the middle of the war, he says, open covenants of peace openly arrived at. Diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. Shall proceed. That's how you make a deal? The man has never negotiated a deal in his life. I spent 40 years negotiating deals. You don't do it in public. Not if, you, not if you want to have two signatures at the bottom. And here he is in 1915 saying, oh, we should have uh, freedom of, of the high seas. No interference with uh, anybody on the high seas. This is in the middle of the German submarine war. Right? Then uh, free trade. Oh, yeah, sure. And here's disarmament in number four. But Forget what I have to say about these. Let's look at number five, because that's what Kung was really interested in. A free open, and this suddenly, after all these absolutes, absolute freedom of the seas, absolute this, absolute that, suddenly you get this very, very lawyerly uh, drafted passage. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that See how absolute everything was? But now we're actually getting to what he wants to talk about. The principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. Very carefully worded. And, uh, but to young Mr. Kung, this is the only bright spot on the horizon that he's ever seen. Here's a, a guy, President Wilson, saying uh, that the population is concerned should have equal weight. Did any of these uh, 14 points get embodied in the treaty that came out of uh, the Paris Peace Conference? No. So spurned by Wilson, he come, ran around Paris looking for anybody to support him. He visited the socialists, he visited the Christian Democrats, he visited everybody he could find, and nobody would listen to him except for one group, the Soviet Communist Party. They listened. So it's not surprising that he listened. Oh yeah, it's the Bobsy twins. And you don't remember the, 
You don't remember the bomb scene. <laughs> oh, maybe there's somebody else there. I don't know. Uh, so in the 20s, after the conference, not for the entire decade, but for much of the 20s, Kung uh, went to Moscow to train to be a revolutionary. He knew nothing about Marxism. I don't think he knew anything about Marxism on the day he died. What he loved was Leninism. That is, the essays by Lenin on how you foment a revolution and free your people, right? And so he became a uh, ardent Leninist because that seemed to be the recipe for uh, uh, freeing his people. This uh, photograph, by the way, was actually taken in the 20s, uh, right outside of Red Square. Here's a uh, young Mr. Kwok at the training school for service in the common term, uh, right here in the circle, uh, the Communist International. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Kwok, formerly known as Nguyen Sen Kung, disappeared for 10 years. And I mean totally disappeared. In the last few years, uh, some Vietnamese historians and a few others have made guesses about exactly where he was. But it's just guesswork. What he did was he went underground for the common term. And they sent him all over the world, we think, uh, to foment revolution. Uh, he was very good with languages. Uh, one of the few things we are pretty sure of is that he spent some considerable time in China and learned uh, Chinese. He may have been taught it uh, as a boy at home, uh, but we, we believe that he also married in China, although later when he became more public, uh, there was never any indication that he was married, but we think he did. And I'm gonna switch gears for a moment, because at the same time, this Nguyen Tai Hock, who, uh, raise your hands, you all familiar with him? Sure, right? I could have picked a half a dozen of these guys. What they were, were people totally unrelated to young Mr. Kung, who were also interested in independence for Vietnam. Uh, but unlike uh, Kung, who became a Leninist revolutionary, uh, Hawk and others of his ilk and of his time formed nationalist movements unrelated to communism, but seeking freedom for Vietnam. Right? And it's important to understand what happened to Hawk and all of them while our young Mr. Kung was circulating out around the world underground. The French colonial administration saw Hawk just like they would later see Kung as a revolutionary. And they started to have some success in the early 30s. The French Foreign Legion was sent in to crush them, which it did. And the French arrested and executed Mr. Nguyen Thai Hoc. And uh, his entire movement was rounded up and put in jail for life. It's most typically in a building in Hanoi that later uh, became known as the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, that's sarcasm, of course. And let's switch back to Mr. Kung. In 1940, 30 years after he left Vietnam, he returned uh, through southern China, we don't know how he got there, uh, alone to fight for Vietnam's independence. And again, uh, we assume that during the 10 years that he was underground, he would change his name in whatever country he went to. So it's no surprise that uh, Kung or Kwok again changed his name, this time for the rest of his life. And as you probably have already figured out, what we're talking about is Ho Chi Minh. I thought when I went to high school and college and law school that Ho Chi Minh was a Vietnamese peasant. He had quite a history under his belt by the time he became Ho Chi Minh. Incredibly sophisticated, incredibly well-traveled, uh, and enormously experienced uh, at creating underground guerrilla movements. Oh, 
flash quiz. <laughs> What's the English translation of Ho Chi Minh? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> Come on, you all know what the... Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? He named himself the Enlightened One. He went from being young Mr. Kung to uh, Nguyen the Patriot. Now he's Ho the Enlightened One. Ho is a typical last name. I think I've already mentioned to you the uh, Vietnamese way of writing their names out is, and it's common in Asia, is to put the family name first and the uh, given name last. So he names himself the Enlightened One. And actually, by that time, he, he was pretty enlightened. He spent the next four years walking alone from village to village across the face of Vietnam trying to persuade villagers to join him in a revolution. And here they are. And they listen. Because the French rule, remember, France didn't regard Vietnam as a place to settle. France regarded uh, Vietnam as an, a colony for economic exploitation. And uh, uh, when you're far, apparently, when you're very far from Paris, uh, the word exploitation takes on some dire meanings. Here he is in another village uh, teaching them how to use World War I rifles. Uh, and he found a partner, a lifelong partner for his struggle with a failed law student. That speaks to me. I can <laughs> definitely uh, identify with that. Vo Nguyen Giap, who is 21 years younger. That's obviously Giap on the left and Ho on the right. Uh, and uh, they met in China uh, because Ho would, uh, was going back and forth during this period. And they truly formed a lifelong bond. It wasn't that they always agreed with each other, but it was a lifelong partnership. Uh, here he is uh, in the earliest days. Uh, yes, he flunked his law boards. So I can definitely identify with that. Uh, and some people really do think he was one of the great military uh, geniuses of the 20th century, but a lot of people disagree with that. Uh, we know from his later, uh, Jeff lived to be 102. I think he died two years ago. Three, three years ago, in 2012. Uh, and he was apparently pretty uh, lucid right up until the last uh, few days. So uh, he studied all the great uh, military strategists, but perhaps equally uh, of importance, he studied Vietnamese history. And the two of them built a guerrilla force. And they actually have a picture. The Viet Minh, this is the thir first 35 guys, uh, you know, gathered from these little villages who, uh, you know, became the 12 disciples and then the 35 disciples. Uh, and um, to say that it was a ragtag group might be uh, giving them too much credit. Uh, and they adopted as their guiding principle uh, a piece of the last will and testament of this general from the 1300s, who was uh, one of the chief uh, Vietnamese victors over Kublai Khan that we talked about last week. The people should be treated with humanity so we can guarantee deep roots and durable bases. They mostly did that, and they often did. Uh, it was a constant struggle um, between this Vietnamese view of how you organize and uh, build support among the people with the Leninist view of how you organize a revolution. But they constantly look back to this as their guiding principle. We could have looked back to that as our guiding principle, but apparently we didn't. He, he all his life, Ho had this um, dichotomy between his commitment to the mass of the Vietnamese, who were mostly rice paddy farmers, and what he learned uh, in Moscow as a Leninist. Um, he didn't believe in multiple sources of uh, power within uh, the country. 
uh, what he uh, did by 1954 was murder the opposition. Uh, now to skip forward a second, from a totally different background education and point of view, uh, No Din Ziem, the first president of the Republic of South Vietnam, had reached the same conclusion. So what we're going to see going forward over the next few classes is a clash between a left-wing dictatorship and a right-wing dictatorship, a left-wing tyrant and a right-wing tyrant. Uh, the difference maybe being that there was that other half of Ho's mind that thought that uh, uh, you had to treat the people with humanity uh, to gain their support. And as you see, uh, one of the people who uh, died at the hands of Ho was No Din Ziem's brother, and we'll talk more about that later. And then in 1942, just when uh, Ho and Jiap are first starting out, along come the Japanese in the middle of World War II, and they occupy after, after bombing Pearl Harbor uh, in Guam, they occupied all of Southeast Asia. Uh, the French capitulated almost instantly. You see the uh, Super modern uh, Japanese army arriving on bicycles. Uh, this is in, I think, Hanoi. Uh, here they're arriving on foot. This is in Saigon. Uh, and the French colonial administration ultimately decided to be faithful to the Vichy regime that took over southern France, you know, under Marshal Pétain, the collaborationist uh, Vichy regime. They were so collaborationist in Vietnam that the Japanese realized they didn't have to actually take over the administration of the company, of the country, excuse me. They kept their soldiers in their bases and let the French continue to run the country for them uh, with some really disastrous results. Uh, here they're arriving on horseback. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, here's our friend Giap, and by the end of the war, he's got 5,000 trained guerrillas. Um, now, who, uh, who trained them? Well, they had help. And I can see from a couple of faces that you know who helped them. We did. We were the critical element to building the Viet Minh. The critical element to creating a vibrant Viet Minh force. Now why is it, by the way, this, I'm sure by now you see Ho and Jia. Uh, one of these two guys, I, I can never remember which, his, his uh, last name is Patti, P-A-T-T-I. I'm not even sure how you pronounce it, maybe Patti. Um, uh, was the head of the OSS. They came in, these are some of the bravest Americans we've ever produced. They came into Vietnam without any real grounding in the people of the language for a very specific reason that I'll mention in a minute. Some of them came in onto the beaches off of submarines and little river boats. Some came in via Chiang Kai-shek's uh, regime through southern China. Some parachuted in. And uh, they, they had one goal, to find uh, downed American airmen and save them from Japanese uh, patrols and guide them back to either China or the coast where they could, uh, on the coast they could be taken off by submarine and from China they could be sent back to the United States <coughs> or to a US base. Uh, and in return for that help, the OSS supplied the Viet Minh with uh, uniforms, training, money, arms, munitions. When you look at this, uh, picture here. You are looking at some of the toughest people we've ever produced, ever. When you, uh, PBS has a movie, a documentary about the SEAL teams and the original, 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 original SEAL teams of World War II. Some of these guys are out of that uh, origin. Because of the way the French and the Japanese were running Vietnam, there was a ghastly famine in northern Vietnam in 44 and 45 for a very simple reason. There was a shortage of rice 
uh, in Japan. So the Japanese took all the rice from Vietnam and sent it uh, to support their troops and didn't leave enough uh, for the Vietnamese. And the starvation and death that occurred was ghastly. Uh, the low estimate is that a million Vietnamese died in that short space of time, starved to death. Uh, there was rice in the way down south, a thousand miles further south, but uh, there was no way to get it up to the north. The, the French had built a railroad from uh, Saigon in the south to Hanoi in the north, but we had bombed it and put it out of business. Uh, and the Viet uh, Minh, this is where the Viet Minh first started to uh, win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people, because they were the only group organized and somewhat effective that was trying to ease uh, the starvation. I could show you really horrible pictures, but there's no need. You know what, you know what it looks like when people starve to death. Uh, it was massive. And at war's end, the Japanese had to surrender because you know Japan had surrendered. And here are all these troops that had never been defeated in Southeast Asia who had a Someone had to organize the surrender. So uh, here you see a Japanese officer surrendering his sword. Um, uh, to the British in the south, uh, the same thing happened uh, when Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Chinese army occupied the north. Now, just stop and think, why, did, why suddenly out of the clear blue do we have uh, the British in the, coming into the south and the the uh, Chinese, uh, the hated foe of the Vietnamese for 2,000 years, coming into the north. Uh, here's Japanese soldiers laying down their arms, literally. So whose idea was it to bring in the British and the Chinese? Well, it was these three guys at the uh, Potsdam Conference. And why did they come up with this brilliant idea? Well, Stalin had no interest in Southeast Asia. It took us. 40 years to really come to grips with that, because after World War II, we were convinced that you know, he, Stalin and Mao were you know, insanely interested in Vietnam. Stalin didn't even know where it was on the map, uh, but that's not a criticism. Truman didn't know where it was either. And as you can see, Churchill closed his eyes to the whole thing. It was just a complete mess. And while it's true that they ultimately left, before they left, Britain gave Vietnam back to the French. Now, why? Yeah, whose idea was that? This guy. Sir Douglas Gracie was so intense, intensely anti-communist that he rearmed the Japanese troops whose surrender he had just accepted. Remember I showed you the picture of all the soldiers laying down their arms? But anything was better than letting uh, Ho's Viet Minh take over the country. So on his own, uh, he decided that he would uh, hold the country for the French to uh, resume their colonial rule. Here are some very tough French troops being saluted by these just surrendered and just rearmed Japanese soldiers. But Ho paid no attention to that. Uh, on September 2, 1945, and this is literally a red letter day in Vietnamese history, uh, in, uh, off of a, standing on a hotel balcony in Hanoi, uh, he declared Vietnamese independence. On the left is part of the crowd. Uh, this is another picture of the crowd. This is the hotel. The, these are the balconies. He's actually standing right behind this flag, uh, which was <laughs> not well placed for purposes of this picture. And now I want to read to you the very brief preamble to Ho's Declaration of Independence, because it will bring a lot of things together. And I want you to close your eyes and let me read this to you. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on earth are equal from birth. All peoples have a right to live, to be happy and free. And the Declaration of the French Revolution made in 1791 on the rights of man also states, all men are born free and with equal rights and must always remain free and have equal rights. These, uh, those are undeniable truths, end of quote. Now you can say, well, that's just a gimmick. No, you're seeing that half of Ho Chi Minh's mind that was in love with the ideals of America that he thought we really stood for. And uh, yes, he was trying to send a message. For sure, he was trying to send a message to us. He had just spent four years in the jungle with the men of the OSS. They loved each other. They were men in arms, fighting under very difficult circumstances, and they saw eye to eye on a great many things. But then things start to move very quickly. In September, General Gracie declares martial law in the southern Vietnam for the purpose of repressing the Viet Minh and creating an opening for the French to come back. Later in September, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, troops come down and occupy the northern portion. And on October 9, French General Leclerc lands with the French Foreign Legion off of American ships to reestablish colonial control. And here they are coming. These are French. This uh, LST is American. This uh, Navy guy right here is an American. Uh, but uh, without those ships, the French wouldn't have made it back because they didn't have a Navy by that time. Uh, so our role uh, suddenly uh, becomes very critical in just the opposite way of the OSS. Ho now announces his program. And normally I wouldn't go through this in such detail, but what I want you to think of as we look at his program is whether you could vote for that right now. National elections with voting rights for everybody over the age of 18. Poll taxes abolished. We know about poll taxes, don't we? Monopolies, actually all monopolies abolished and opium, prostitution, alcohol, and gambling prohibited. Well, you say, <laughs> let's not go too far. <laughs> but actually, Ho uh, was kind of a Puritan uh, all his life. Uh, large French farmlands confiscated and given to landless peasants. Uh, to end the famine as a temporary device, every piece of fallow land, uh, arable land, was given to farmers for immediate cultivation. Bombed out uh, rice paddy dikes and riverine dikes to be repaired immediately, which they did. In the factories and mines, which is where some of the worst and most oppressive French policies were carried out, uh, an eight-hour day by statute and unions permitted. All public utilities to be nationalized. Nothing very uh, radical about that. And a massive literacy campaign begun with a goal of universal literacy within a year. It took them a little more than a year, but they carried it out. And the University of Hanoi reopened. It had been closed by the French and as a hotbed of sedition. And then for a year, in 46, you have this uh, very uneasy semi-war, semi-peace, because it took a while for the French to get back to Vietnam with sufficient uh, <coughs> troops to really control it. And Ho was really focused in the north uh, in trying to get the Chinese to go back home. He is supposedly, uh, supposed to have said when he made this ultimate deal that you'll see where he put up with the French, he said, I would rather smell French excrement for five years than Chinese excrement for the rest of my life. Uh, I'm told he didn't actually use the word excrement, but <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, they were uh, totally focused on getting the Chinese to go home. And if you stop and think about the dates, uh, by 47, Chiang Kai-shek had bigger problems at home than he did in uh, Vietnam. And twice, Ho entered into peace negotiations with France, once in Vietnam, once in Paris. Uh, 
Uh, there are marvelous pictures of him dressed in his gorilla uh, black pajamas being welcomed at the Versailles uh, Palace. Uh, but the key was that they couldn't pull it off. The French government still wanted uh, Vietnam because it was a source of enormous wealth to, to France. So in November, the French Navy bombards Haiphong in the north, uh, and the uh, Japs forces retreat, and then they lay, lay siege in December. Uh, and again, Ho and Jap have to retreat this time back into the mountains because by this time, the French have sufficient troops there, uh, and uh, Ho and Jap don't have the ability uh, to face them. Who was the OSS during this? They went home. And they try to persuade their superiors, uh, really in the State Department, hey, this guy Ho, yeah, he's a communist, but he's a nationalist. He wants freedom and independence, and he loves us. And uh, the State Department didn't pay any attention. And this is where, in 47, 48, what we call McCarthyism really began. We've, we've put the word McCarthyism onto the whole uh, movement of the right wing of the United States to suppress communism in the United States. And we think of, correctly, we think of Senator McCarthy as being uh, a man of 53, 54, 55, and then in 56, you know, he lost uh, power. But the movement that McCarthyism describes began the minute the Cold War started in 47, 48. Uh, and you had a reaction in the United States uh, that I would call uh, so extreme as to verge, in my view, uh, virtually on a religious cult of anti-communism. Uh, and the OSS, um, which in 47 was reformed into the CIA, uh, they got lost in the shuffle. Those brave men you saw <coughs> went home and became insurance salesmen because they couldn't make any headway in Washington. This was almost a game changer, you know, one of those, oh, almost events. Uh, the French, who were, you know, by this time, a pretty sophisticated military force. Uh, you know, we always think of the French as the army that collapsed in World War II. Well, the civilian government collapsed and the French generals collapsed, but the French actually have very, very uh, tough soldiers. Uh, and they almost captured Ho and Jiang. Came very, very close. Uh, so in 48, realizing that they got to do something different, uh, they began discussions, the French began discussions with Bao Dai, the last in the Nguyen dynasty uh, of emperors, uh, in the theory that they're going to create an autonomous state of Vietnam. And Ho would have agreed to this uh, two years before if it were an interim step to independence. But this time, he didn't trust the French at all. So we'll take a quick look at Bao Dai. He's a fascinating guy, uh, had a long life. You remember last week, we looked at some of the emperors uh, in the 1800s, all of the Nguyen dynasty. Uh, he's the last of the line. Here he is. All Vietnamese children are adorable. The reason I can say that is because all little children are adorable. <laughs> I never met a, a little child that wasn't adorable. Here he is, I think, as a 18-year-old on the right in his ceremonial robes as emperor. Here he is in, on the left, uh, living the good life on the French Riviera. Here he is as an old man. Uh, he lived, uh, you know, right up until uh, what, 20 years ago? No, 18 years ago. Uh, he was the, the last of the great playboy emperors. But he had a problem. He would collaborate with anybody. He collaborated with the French. He collaborated with the Japanese. He collaborated with the Viet Minh. He collaborated with the French again. And then he collaborated with No Dinh Diem of South Vietnam, who ousted him. And ultimately, he collaborated with anyone willing to pay his gambling debts and bar bills. Uh, he had six wives, many, many, many children, a great many of whom are still alive, and concubines too numerous to count.
The reason that he was able to collaborate with everybody is that everybody wanted the emperor to be on their side to establish legitimacy. But if you were a Vietnamese, <laughs> any sense at all, it just strikes me that he'd be the last guy in the world that would give your movement legitimacy. But I guess from the point of view of the Japanese, the French, the you know whatever, they thought he would give them a sheen. Uh, he um, he used them to finance what he loved best, uh, and he spent most of his life living in Paris and on the French Riviera. But then there was a true game changer. I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that in '49, Mao Zedong and his communist uh, army uh, overwhelmed Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist army, and uh, the communists became the rulers of China. And that truly was a game changer, well, all around the world, but in particular in Vietnam. And in 1950, in response to that, the French tried to uh, set up this so-called independent state of Vietnam. Uh, they did the same thing in Laos and Cambodia. Um, and uh, it's mostly a sham. But the army that they created was not a sham. And in the last, next to last class, we're going to see the remnants of that army playing a pretty important role. Uh, they, the French armed uh, Vietnamese uh, non-communist forces, uh, trained them, and they became uh, uh, a, real, uh, a real influence. Uh, and by year end, the Chinese, the new Chinese government is starting to provide the Viet Minh with very substantial aid and assistance. And the US very reluctantly is starting to do the same to the French. Truman's administration, which of course uh, was you know, still peopled in many ways by FDR's uh, uh, civilian uh, people, they were very reluctant to help the French. Number one, we were, you know, as a matter of policy, not real uh, uh, sympathetically inclined to um, uh, colonial masters. Uh, and by the end of World War II, we were definitely not uh, sympathetic to the French. Uh, de Gaulle had managed to alienate every uh, Western leader by that time. Uh, and there was a real reluctance to get involved in what seemed like uh, uh, a step against the flow of history. So France threatened to stay out of NATO. That was a pretty good threat, because without France, there really wasn't a NATO. Uh, and the Brits, who really wanted to have NATO, uh, were pretty clear that the Communist Party of France was about to win the next national election in France, and they didn't want that at all. So they pressured Truman to help the French in Vietnam in exchange for uh, France going into NATO and suppressing the French Communist Party. But the game changer came in June of 50 when North Korea invaded South Korea. And suddenly all of the fears of this, uh, particularly in America, of this um, aggressive, expansive, attempt by the communist powers to dominate the world seemed, uh, in this tiny little country of uh, Korea, to be coming true. So Truman started sending arms and men and money into Indochina. And he ultimately uh, essentially paid for the French war in Vietnam. The, uh, it allowed, he was sending under the, the Marshall Plan to France, and then, as he was to other places in Europe, an enormous amount of money to help France rebuild. But France spent that same amount trying to keep Vietnam and the French Empire. Uh, so in effect, we financed the whole deal. But for four years, and this is important to remember, the French army in Indochina slugged it out with a Viet Min, and it was very, very heavy fighting. The French soldiers, both the uh, French boys of, of metropolitan France, 
and the French Foreign Legion and other French colonial forces uh, fought very, very heavily and very bravely. Uh, and by that time, we were paying for 80% of the war. Uh, but even 20% ultimately proved too much for the uh, French people because the war started really in 46, so you have 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54. You have nine years of war. And with, by about the third or fourth year, with every passing year, the, uh, the French people just got tired. It was endless war. As bravely as the French fought, as many victories you know, in battles that they had, they didn't seem to be able to, to destroy the Viet Minh and restore a kind of colonial order that would uh, make it once more a useful part of the French Empire. Uh, the Viet Minh were unable to defeat the French. It was a stalemate, but a stalemate of very, very heavy fighting, very heavy losses. We'll look at that in a minute. And so by the end, uh, even 20% of the cost of the war seemed like too much. So to, just to give you a sense of the difference between uh, Vietnam and uh, a colony like Algeria, where there were over a million French people living in Algeria when the Algerians revolted, uh, many of whom, many of these French people living in Algeria, had lived there for generations. But here, out of, in Vietnam, out of a total population of 20,700,000, if you leave aside the military and government officials who were just sent in for a year or two or three, there were only 34,000 French civilians who were permanent residents in 1940. So you know, the people back in France are thinking, what, what are we fighting for? To hold on to a bunch of zinc mines or rubber <coughs> tree plantations? Uh, and uh, France did a lot of things um, to try to create, uh, the government that is, to try to create uh, some morale building and, and some uh, forces independent of French opinion. But it was very, very hard by the end. Uh, and then in January of 53, Mr. Smiles gets elected. Uh, hey, I like Ike. I still like Ike. Uh, uh, with that smile, how could you not like him? Uh, is there a political candidate on the scene today running for the presidency of either party that has a smile like that? No. So he appoints Dulles, his secretary of state, and Dulles' brother, Alan, uh, the biggest womanizer in the history of the US government uh, as director of the CIA. And that's only the part we know. He was the director of the CIA. And before that in the OSS, I'm sure most of it we don't know. But what we do know is world class. Uh, Dulles, uh, the older brother, um, it, had gone to law school and become the senior partner of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York, which at the time, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, Sullivan and Cromwell was probably the premier law firm in the United States. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, a deeply religious uh, Presbyterian, I think, uh, and uh, was anti-communist. He was more anti-communist than he was Presbyterian. And he would tell you that. Uh, he had two religions, and it's clear that anti-communism came first. Uh, in November of 53, uh, in desperation, the French started to use napalm against the Viet Minh. This gives you a tiny sense of just how devastating that can be. And the napalm came from us, along with the planes. Uh, so it was really us doing that. And then, uh, by 54, the French are at the end of their rope. Uh, and m many French people finally woke up to the fact that a republic, France, that was born in revolution itself in 1789 and stood for uh, freedom, uh, sh you know, should not be running colonies uh, all over the world. Uh, and you know, it, 
it really became impossible to hold the French populace together to continue the war. Um, liberty, equality, and fraternity didn't square with what they were doing in Vietnam. And yet the government and the military um, believed that keeping its colonies was essential to restoring la gloire de France, the glory of France and its position as a major power, and, and most of all, the revenue. It was amazingly profitable uh, in terms of factories, mines, rubber plantations, tea, rice, uh, zinc mines. Uh, they wanted the money. So in May of 53, they sent one of their best generals, or at least up until that time, he was one of their best, <laughs> to command all French forces in Indochina. But their instructions, this is one of the great moments in military history. Their instructions were crystal clear. Just hold the fort. Minimize casualties. We're going to start peace negotiations with Ho Chi Minh. Don't spend an extra French soldier's life. Just stand back. Uh, but something got lost. Maybe they, maybe they said it in English like I just did. <laughs> something got lost uh, and in the translation. And he decided that to strengthen France's posture in these upcoming negotiations, he would place, I love this phrase, an impregnable force. Impregnable. I want you to remember that word, ladies and gentlemen. And he would do it deep in the Tonkin Mountains to the west of Hanoi. We'll look at it in a minute. And this would be such an irresistible target to Jia that he would come out of the jungles in the daytime, unlike the usual Viet Minh guerrilla tactics, and attack this impregnable force uh, deep in there, um, deep in the Viet Minh territory. You know, they picked out a spot deep in Viet Minh territory, and they, they thought, Jia will not be able to resist this and he will be destroyed. In this single blow, the Viet Minh will be wiped out. And on a tiny scale, they had done this, a very, very small scale. So in November of 53, Navarre and Major General René Cogni, or Cogni, maybe, but Cognac, Cogni, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but that's a name you should remember. They decided that they found the perfect place for this game journey. You may have heard that name, DMV Improved. So here's where it is on our topographical map. Up in the north, here's Hanoi and Haiphong on the coast. You go 175 miles west, and you can see how mountainous this is. I mean, these are, these are real mountains. And here is this valley right there of DMV Phu. And the veteran they chose to lead the crack French troops. They only describe troops as crack who are about to get in big trouble. Whenever you see any, any army referred to the crack French troops, the crack American troops, you know you're about to hear big trouble. <laughs> he picked Navarre on the right, picks uh, Christian de Castries as the commander of this force. He really was a very seasoned, very, very tough, very experienced general, a, a fighting combat frontline general. And before the battle began, they uh, had to deal with what the civilian situation in France now was. 7% of French voters favored continuing the war. So Navarre, you see, is saying, oh, I can see which way this is going. The 7% solution is about to be dumped on my head. I got to get into DMVM Fu and end this once and for all before the negotiations begin. Uh, I assume that percentage uh, <laughs> fell further. But they were certain of victory. And, and the reason uh, was what I put up on the board. That the place they picked was so tough, and we're going to look at it in just a second, that Jiap would never be able to mass enough troops or artillery or even more basically, would never be able to keep his troops supplied long enough to defeat the French. And French artillery and air power would be decisive and would wipe them out. Because they'd have to come out of the jungle. Actually, it's not jungle. It's mountain. It's um, 
not, not um, it's deciduous trees. And here it is, which if you have any military training at all, uh, or even just some plain common sense, uh, strikes you as perhaps not the most likely place to put 16,000 crack troops. But the French weren't idiots. These are the mountains, and it's all around, whoops, sorry, that Jack would have to get across. You know, the French came in by air. And on these lower, I guess for, for purposes of this lecture, I'll call these foothills, you know, the French put very strong fortified redoubts at each of these peaks that I'm outlining. Uh, it was circular, so I can't show you where the photographer was standing. You know, it comes around full circle. Uh, and uh, they were sure that through these mountain passes, uh, Jap would only be able to send a trickle at a time. So they massed uh, the French forces. Here, the valley, you can't see it all, is actually uh, eight miles long and in some places uh, a mile or two wide. Um, it, it's, I believe the French word is formidable. Uh, and they the French believed that as the, um, as the Viet Minh came over these uh, hills, uh, the French artillery, which was massed at the uh, bottom of the valley, would wipe them out, as would the French uh, fighter bombers. You might say to yourself, because I'll cover that in a second, where did the French get fighter bombers? Well, there's an answer. In fact, Jap got somewhere between 50 and 100,000 troops up there. The French had 16,000. Jap got somewhere between 50 and 100,000 troops. And he hauled up heavy, heavy artillery and anti aircraft guns, one by one, hand by hand. It took him months. Uh, the French were vaguely aware that something was going on on the other side. <laughs> They were. The French were not stupid about this. Navarre and Cogni made a dreadful error of judgment, but they were not stupid. Here's a photo. This is the real thing. This is just one artillery piece being hauled up the mountain. And there were, and the Viet Minh hauled up hundreds and hundreds of these. And part of Jap's true genius was realizing that it wasn't enough to just haul up the guns. He had to haul up the shells, and he had to haul up, most of all, the food and other supplies for his 50, 75, 100,000 troops. And he organized literally tens of thousands of Vietnamese peasants, um, most of whom volunteered. Not all, uh, but when your neighbor volunteered, you know, the pressure was on, you'd volunteer because this was, uh, uh, propagandized in the best sense is this is our moment. This is when we are going to kick the French out of Vietnam. And there was enormous support for it. Not funding, everybody. Who was funding the Jap's operation? The Chinese. Absolutely the Chinese. They came down into the north of Vietnam at the Viet Minh's request, right just over the border, and set up huge supply depots. Uh, and what Jap was fighting with was Chinese arms uh, and Chinese uh, uniforms. The siege lasted um, from February uh, through the beginning of May. The French fought very, very bravely. What happened uh, was that the Viet Minh came over the mountains and on the downward slope, here's the valley below, on the downward slope, they would dig into the mountain and place mortars down below the lip of the downward slope so that the mortar is completely hidden from anybody looking up here. But the mortar can shoot up and over the lip. And there were thousands of them. Uh, and they, were, they also brought up a whole bunch of wooden dummies and placed them above the ground, but again, from way down in the uh, valley floor, the wooden dummies looked real, so the French spent a lot of time 
shooting wooden dummy, uh, shooting at wooden dummy guns. Uh, they, uh, the fighting was fierce, uh, and the the French, who thought, well, we'll, we'll keep every, everybody in the valley floor supplied by air, uh, did not come to grips with the fact that the weather might not be too too good for flying in, and you see these guys. Um, looking at uh, death in the face here. Uh, a, lot of a lot of Americans later in Vietnam said, we'll have a totally different experience in Vietnam because uh, we have helicopters by the thousands. Uh, the French had helicopters. They just didn't have thousands. Uh, but that wasn't really the decisive uh, thing. Now, this is an important, as things really started to get very, very upsetting in, at Dien Bien Phu, some key people in the United States government came to Eisenhower and said, uh, you gotta help out the French, this is not right. Uh, we can't have these Asian communists, and they didn't use the phrase Asian communists. Uh, they were not politically correct in the early 50s, they used some pretty unpleasant uh, substitutes for Asian communists. And uh, among them, Democratic Senator Mike Mansfield said we gotta help them out, it's not right that a French army, our allies, should get wiped out by these Asian communists. And Eisenhower said publicly, quote, nobody is more opposed to intervention than I am. And he maintained that posture throughout publicly. But secretly, starting in late November uh, of 53, as the French were moving in, the United States lent Navarre uh, 12 flying boxcars I'm going to show you one in a minute. I say supposedly flown by a French cruise. They were flown by the CIA. The CIA had earlier set up a front, not a communist front, ladies and gentlemen, a CIA front called the Civilian Air Transport Company, the CAT. The CAT was run by the CIA, which was run by the USA. You, you got to keep all this straight. Uh, and. Uh, the, as long as the weather was good, they could fly in an enormous amount of material and keep the French going. But then a couple of things happened. Oh, there's a flying boxcar. That's a C-119. It's big. It's really big. But it needs a landing strip. Uh, land. Well, the French built one. The French built a landing strip with this in mind. Uh, but we'll see in a minute that that became a problem. During the battle itself, from February through the beginning of May of 54, the US provided uh, France with 24 uh, pilots, uh, maintenance crews, mechanics, two squadrons of B-26 Invader bombers, and US pilots flew at least 682 sorties. But Eisenhower publicly, I, I can't bear this because I like that, he lied to us. It's just, I, I'm still breaking out into a sweat uh, that he, he would lie to us. Uh, he sent a lot of help uh, to the French, but then the, a further issue came up. Uh, if the CIA had bothered to ask the local inhabitants about the weather in January, February, March, April, <clears throat> they would have learned that it rained a lot. Uh, which, and in those days, we did not fly in the rain. They also used, the Viet Minh used trenches and tunnels uh, to get close to each of the French outposts. Remember the ones on the top of the hills and then down lower? They would tunnel in and pop up and blow them up, uh, which interestingly enough was exactly what the French had done for us at Yorktown in uh, the 1781. Uh, the exact same siege strategies. Nothing had changed in uh, 200 years, uh, but it was pretty deadly. Jap's artillery destroyed the landing zones, and his anti-aircraft guns destroyed a lot of the planes that were trying to fly in. Uh, and uh, in fact, when it became clear that the whole French artillery strategy was being defeated by um, Jia, and that it had all been a snare and a delusion. 
the chief artillery officer of the French walked out in front of his men and blew his head off uh, in shame. The last plan out, or at least so the picture is labeled. Yes, almost certainly piloted by an American. By April, uh, it was so desperate at Dien Bien Phu that Ike's State Department, his military, and his intelligence advisors were debating what they could do to bail the French out. And the historical record today, I think, is 99% clear that they debated lending the French <coughs> nuclear bombs. It's, uh, it's really 100% clear. Uh, one well-known historian says that there was a meeting on that subject in which Ike was the only person in the room opposed to doing it. It went back and forth, back and forth daily. But there was apparently one critical meeting in which the only person opposed to lending the French tactical nuclear weapons was Ike himself. Needless to say, he said no. On May 7th, Giap's troops made their final surge. It was a series of surges over late April and May in which they would push the French back and fall back, then push again, fall back, push again, coming down those hills and coming across the valley. They lost, Jap's troops lost enormous numbers, but they never gave up. Here's the last known photo of de Castries uh, before he was overrun. And I love this for one, for really two words in this conversation over the radio between de Castries and Major General Cogni. De Castries, the Viets are everywhere. The situation is very grave. The combat is confused and goes on all about. I feel the end is approaching, but we will fight to the finish. And this son of a bitch says, of course you will fight to the finish. He's sitting in Hanoi in French luxury. He's like, well, of course you will. Uh, I might, if I were in the Cognis, I might say something like, I admire your bravery in fighting to the finish. Or, I am enormously moved by your willingness to fight to the finish. But those two words, of course you will. <laughs> of course. I screwed it up and put you in an impossible situation. So, of course, you'll fight to the finish and make heroes of us all. And the final transmission was from the radio operator. And I don't believe, he said, vive la France. I just cannot believe that at a moment of horror and uh, facing imminent death, he signed up with vive la France. And maybe he did. What do I know? What do I know? Sitting here in my blue suit, you know, on this lovely uh, day. Uh, you know, maybe he did say that. And this is a, a real photograph. This is the Viet Minh flag uh, flying over Dien Bien Phu. And on May 8, the French opened up negotiations with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in Geneva. And here are the captured French troops marching off under guard. Uh, you can see that this is not a happy day. Uh, in fact, it's a very tragic day, as I'll point out in a second. France admitted, this is the lesser issue. They admitted to 1,500 to 2,000 battle deaths and five to 6,000 wounded at Dien Bien Phu. But 11,700 French soldiers were captured during the battles or at the close. In that photograph you just saw, you were seeing the bulk of them <coughs> being marched off. <coughs> and only about 3,500 of those survived. Now, that was pretty awful. There are, there, there, there are French historians who say that the numbers are even worse. Partly it was because marching them back to someplace where they could be housed and fed uh, 
was just a ghastly, it was like the Bataan march, march of the Japanese marching the American soldiers in the Philippines. A lot of the French died because uh, uh, the Viet Minh didn't have the wherewithal to feed them. The, the um, conditions for the Viet Minh soldiers was extremely harsh as well. Uh, a lot of the, of the wounded died because they couldn't get medical attention and they had to keep marching. Uh, and then a lot of them were clearly killed uh, under circumstances that we can only imagine. Um, but it was, uh, it was devastating. The Viet Minh admitted that they suffered, suffered 4,000 dead. Uh, the French claimed that the real numbers were 8,000 Viet Minh killed and 15,000 wounded. My guess is the French numbers are probably more correct. And here's the final toll for the French. They sent to Indochina 230 plus, 230,000 uh, French nationals. By that I mean uh, young men who were born and raised in metropolitan France, 123,000 North Africans from <coughs> Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, places like that, 73,000 French Foreign Legion, most, a great many of whom were Germans, and then 60,000 from Sub-Saharan Africans for a total of close to 500,000 troops, 489,500, 110,000 were killed. That's 22.5%. If all of you amateur military historians <coughs> want to go back and look at what, quote, acceptable, unquote, uh, casualty rates are, they're a lot lower than 22.5%. I want you to focus on this. France did not fail for lack of effort or sacrifice. They spent nine years fighting very hard and often very skillfully to hold on to Vietnam, and they couldn't do it. Nine years. Right? 110,000 men killed. Figure there are three times as many wounded. So when you in a later class, we're going to look at the American effort. This compares very, very favorably in terms of what the French were willing to do to try to hold on to Vietnam. They made an enormous effort. And all that most people remember is Dien Bien Phu, where they lost their shirt. But up until Dien Bien Phu, they had fought very, very skillfully. Just hang on a second. The impregnable fortress did not destroy the Viet Minh. What it destroyed was the French government. And in June, uh, Pierre Mendes France of the Radical Party was elected prime minister. Don't be misled by the word radical. In France at that time, it was the party of the upper middle class, educated, professional elite. Uh, uh, Pierre Mendes France was French Jew who came from a comfortable upper middle class family. He had a sterling war record, first uh, with the French underground, and then he escaped and joined de Gaulle's Free French. Uh, and uh, he was a truly sophisticated, progressive, liberal guy who uh, should have had a better end. Uh, he, the minute he became the prime minister, he stopped all combat operations and began serious talks with the Democratic uh, Republic of Vietnam and China, which is what we're going to focus on next week. And to truly understand the French, I again urge you to see this movie. Uh, many of you will be perfectly satisfied to just spend two hours watching Catherine Deneuve. Um, I certainly am. Uh, but the more you focus on it. It's an amazingly sophisticated uh, film. Here's one scene in which uh, the, uh, the, the Neuve character is the owner of a French rubber plantation and she adopts a um, Vietnamese uh, young baby actually and then over the course of the movie grows up into this lovely young lady. Now notice how Miss Deneuve has her right arm firmly around her uh, uh, adopted Vietnamese daughter and with her other arm is clearly pointing her 
in the right direction. <laughs> you knew that, right? Tell me you knew that. You knew that. You get it? You got it? Good. Good. <laughs> you will not be disappointed by this film. Yes, sir. Yes, it had just started, uh, but it was not. Um, it was not yet at the, at the. Yeah, in the late fifties is when it really blew up. Yes, sir. How was the population of uh, Vietnam during that period of time? It was the population of Vietnam in nineteen forty was twenty million seven hundred thousand. Um, today it's ninety million. Uh, and uh, there's still a lot of empty land in Vietnam. Yes, sir. Do you believe that if we had supported Ho Chi Minh back when the OSS was supporting him, the, the history of the world would be different <coughs> and Vietnam would have been an ally of us throughout time? The answer is yes and no, but I, I'm not equivocating. I will tell you why, uh, with all um, speculation about things that didn't happen, uh, you, you have to take account of you know, the most likely possibilities. He, he was clearly a nationalist as much as he was a communist. He clearly loved Americans, loved them. But he really was a communist in the Leninist tradition. And once the Cold War started, and the, what I call, and there are people who disagree with me, what I call the communist hysteria swamped American foreign policy, the likelihood that we would, would have been able to work out some kind of rational, modus vivendi with the Ho Chi Minh government strikes me as pretty speculative. We ultimately did a tiny bit of that with, um, what's his name in Yugoslavia? Tito. Uh, but only a tiny bit. And this was, you know, 10 years earlier. And, um, you know, the, the, as you'll see over the next two classes, the North Vietnamese government, uh, particularly after Ho was less dominant in the government, was so repressive. I mean, it really became a police state. Um, whether those forces were inevitable, it's hard to say. Remember, ZM in the South, we put in as the great democratic uh, centralist, and he turned out to be really almost as repressive. Remember I showed you a slide which I said that by 1954, um, uh, Ho Chi Minh had murdered 15,000 people who disagreed with him? Well, by 1960, ZM had murdered 12 to 15,000 people in the South who disagreed with him. Uh, so could we have worked it out? You know, if we had, remember uh, Colonel Patti? And I said, yeah, if we had elected him president, <laughs> I'm sure we would have worked it out, but we didn't. So it's just unknowable, but, but tantalizing, really tantalizing. Because in the same way that Nixon, the great Republican anti-communist, was able to reverse position and go to China, one might have thought that Eisenhower, you know, who had immense popularity, could have reached out. But Number one, and this is going to go all through the next class, I don't think Eisenhower uh, ever really truly understood how popular he was and how much power that gave him to lead the country in more progressive ways. Uh, so I think the question you're asking is incredibly tantalizing and ultimately unknowable. Next Thursday, you are going to see live action of Dulles and his anti-communism to such a degree that it takes your breath away uh, how, uh, well, it was a religion. That's what it was. Uh, we don't quarrel when somebody goes to their temple or church or 
cathedral and uh, bows down to the, uh, their god. We don't, we don't have any problem with that. But when Dulles lets his entire life as an international diplomat be shaped by his anti-communism, it is breathtaking. There was one last, oh yes sir, right here. Oh wait a minute, I gotta ask you a favor. This gentleman had raised his hand. speculation against 1959's ascendancy of Mao that we could have had rapprochement with Ho Chi Minh is just, it's pretty high in the sky. Could be. Yeah. It's, as I say, it's tantalizing, but speculative. Uh, you got to get in there early. We got in there early, and then you got to follow through. It's basic management in any business enterprise. You got to get in there early, and you got to have follow through. We got in there early. We weren't too good on the follow through. So I don't, I don't disagree with you. Particularly once uh, you're going to, I think some of you are going to be startled by what happened to Ho Chi Minh inside his own government. Yes, sir? What lesson should Vietnam hold to the United States with respect to its current independence in Iraq and Afghanistan? That's my next course. Next, uh, <laughs> next. <laughs> well, let me, let me not make light of that. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, and we see we as a government, and when I say we as a government, it's our government whether we have no vote for it or not. It's us, right? Uh, and I think there is a, a very clear uh, lesson that Ho Chi Minh reached back to the 1300s to the last will and testament of that uh, general who beat uh, Kublai Khan. He said, you have to treat the people of a country uh, humanely so you, you develop deep roots, deep roots. So if we go in as we, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna use shorthand, I'm gonna take a lot of history and compress it. As we, as we went into Iraq, thinking if we just showed up, knocked off the Republican Guard, the Iraqi people would greet us as saviors and love us, that's absurd. That's just absurd. And second of all, if we then choose to stay, what country in the world wants us to take them over? Uh, well, remember the movie, The Mouse That Roared? You know, <laughs> there was a country about the size of this hall <laughs> that wanted us to come in and take them over because they were bankrupt. But most countries, uh, that's, that's why I have a lot of respect for the senior George Bush. Remember when the Iraqis invaded and took over Kuwait. He went in, how many days did he spend? 100 days, 40 days, whatever. He knocked the Iraqis out and said, here's your country back. We're out. The notion that we can do in today's world um, nation building in a country just to pick one out, like Somalia or Syria, give me a break. It's not that it's, uh, not a noble goal, it's just beyond anybody's capability to go in and rebuild a country torn apart by civil war. The Shia, for, just as an example, the Shia and the Sunnis have been fighting at each other's throats for a thousand years, actually about 1,300 years. What, we're gonna go in and <laughs> fix it? Uh, now, you know what people do, they say to them, well, I you always look at all the negative stuff. Look at what we did after World War II with Germany and Japan. Rebuilt their societies. Turned them into bastions of democracy. Well, I would say that those are, in fact, two examples of nation building that worked. But uh, in today's world, in today's world, Look, Syria is the best example. What's happening inside Syria is ghastly, but I have yet to see anybody actually make, with knowledge of what's going on, make a detailed description of how we, going in with boots on the ground, could actually make it better. The lesson of Vietnam is that we go in and we make it worse. We went into Vietnam with noble ideals. 
And we ended up killing two million Vietnamese. What was noble about that? Yes, sir. As you know, I'm jumping ahead, but one of the issues in the Vietnam problem was the failure to allow the vote that was agreed upon because Eisenhower and Dulles still had to lose. Well, that's an interesting point. And that is, in fact, the heart of the next class. Uh, that's what I said. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to jump ahead. But <laughs> let me just say that the words agreed upon, right. agreed upon, are going to get looked at very, very carefully next week. And I think many of you are going to be quite startled at what was and was not agreed upon and who signed and who didn't sign. Uh, but you're 100% right that the Americans understood very clearly in 56 that if there was a true national vote impartially, the UN run, Ho Chi Minh would be the president of the entire country, period. Period, right? But I'm going to stop, unless that somebody has an urgent need to ask me another question, I'm going to stop because you put your finger on exactly what the heart of the next class is about. Because what happened in Geneva is what really shaped the next 15 years. the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact Ollie today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive.